I'm going to attempt to share with you a great mystery, the Cappadocian teaching on the monarchy of the Father, because it's one of those chapters that really needs to be grasped as best as possible, albeit conceptually, as we move forward in trying to capture something of the ethos of the church, something of the ethos of the fathers. Now, I'm sure you've heard this term before, but I'm also fairly sure that you probably haven't heard what I'm about to say to you. The relationship between the father and the son, and of course the fourth century is the period where the question is, what is the divine status of the Son and Word of God? Who is Christ? The relationship then between the Father and the Son is a natural and essential one. It's not a relationship by grace, because the Logos is God by nature, and he is not God by grace. The Logos, therefore, participates in the essence of the archetype who is the Father. Now, the Logos has the glory from the Father by nature and not by grace. The Father gives his glory to the Logos, but he does not give his fatherhood to the Logos. So the Father is the source of the existence of the Logos, but he is not the source of the existence of the glory of the Logos, because the Father gives his own glory to the Logos. Listen carefully. The glory is not only the glory of the Logos, but also of the Father. We've mentioned this before. The existence of the Logos is from the Father, but it is not the existence of the Father. The Logos is not the Father. The Father and the Logos are two distinct and unique hypostases. So we have God the Father and God the Logos. But we do not have two gods. We have one Godhead, one divinity. Let me rephrase this. The essence and natural energy, that's everything that flows from these, glory, kingdom, grace, power, light, etc., which are simply different names of the natural energy used to express a specific characteristic of man's encounter with God. These are common to all three divine hypostases. And they are made common, they are communicated by God the Father. While the hypostatic characteristics of fatherhood and unbegottenness, sonship and begottenness, spiritness, or as St. Basil puts it, sanctification and procession are non-communicable. And so they are unique to each of the three divine hypostases, respectively. But more about this presently. So the Father is the cause of the existence of the hypostasis of the Logos and of the Holy Spirit. He gives them their existence, but he does not give existence to the essence and the natural energy of the Logos and the Holy Spirit. That's because he gives them his own essence and natural energy. So the Father is the cause of the existence of the Logos and the Holy Spirit and gives his essence and natural energy to the two persons, 
He's not the cause of the essence and natural energy, because the essence and energy are his. So he makes common the essence with its natural energy, but he is the cause of existence of the hypostasis of the Logos and the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. So to sum up, the Father is the cause of the hypostases of the Son and the Holy Spirit, but not of the essence or natural energy which they have in common. The Father communicates or makes common his essence and natural energy to the other two hypostases, but he is not the cause of them because they are his and they have no cause. So, actually, it's very straightforward. The Son receives his hypostatic existence from the Father. The Holy Spirit receives his hypostatic existence from the Father. The first, by generation. The second, by procession and not by generation. But the essence and the energy or the life of the Holy Trinity is given by the Father to the two hypostases, the Son and the Holy Spirit, so they are communicated to them. This is what constitutes the oneness of God, that they have one essence and energy, all the things that we mentioned before, one glory, one light, one kingdom, and so on. And therefore, they are all consubstantial. And perhaps we could add one more qualification, and that is that when we say that the Son receives his hypostatic existence and the Holy Spirit receives his hypostatic existence, as from a cause, they are caused. This takes place in sempiternity, in pre-eternity. This takes place not only outside of time, but this is before all ages. So therefore, this is characteristic of divine existence on the divine plane of existence. The difficulty, conceptually, you can always argue against anything. The focus on the monarchy of the Father, in conceptual terms, could imply a certain supremacy of the Father. We use the word cause and caused and Human language is not only inextricably intertwined with notions of time, but there's also implicit orders of rank in there when the fathers again and again try to convey that this is a trinity of equality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And indeed, in terms of theologia, the realm of God in himself. And when we speak of economia, the divine economy, then we find, as we're going on to say, we will also talk about the distinctions in God, not only fatherhood, sonship, and in the case of the Holy Spirit, proceeding, but also the fact and especially the fact that one of the Holy Trinity became flesh. We have to look at that as well. So there is a certain tension just by the fact that we're using human language, taking images and concepts from the created realm in order to convey something of a reality that really cannot be described but can only be lived and known by experience. And that's why Orthodox theology is so often described as signposts, pointers, symbols designed to let you know that you're within 
a safe space moving in the right direction, but that itself is not theology. Theology is the experience of God, which we see in the saints. So, I said that we could pause there. Actually, I wonder if I shouldn't say one or two things at this point, since it just leads on so naturally. We mentioned the distinctions in God, the unity, the way that the Cappadocians affirm the unity of God, the Holy Trinity. And now we come to the question of the distinctions within the Godhead. How do the Cappadocians help us to understand the diversity in God? We said that humans each have their own energy, their own will, but the three hypostases of the Trinity in all that they do have only one shared single energy, one shared single will. But you may ask, and understandably so, doesn't this prove too much? In his work, That There Are Not Three Gods, where St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the action of each in any matter is not separate and individualized, you may well ask, well, if all that we know about God, we know from his activity in the created order, and if God's energy in the created order is always one, how do we in fact know that God is not just one, but also three? Doesn't this prove too much? And in answer to this question, of course, the Cappadocians say, yes, the action of the three persons to the creation is always indivisible. All three always act together. But doesn't each one of the three hypostases make his own contribution? We know that the work peculiar to the Son is made manifest in and through the Incarnation, and that the work peculiar to the Holy Spirit is revealed fully at Pentecost. But what about the Father's work? Are we left with the Irenaean image of the two hands of God, where God the Father remains always transcendent and unknowable. Let's take, for example, the Incarnation, where we know that only the Son, the second hypostasis, becomes incarnate, although the Father and the Holy Spirit are also involved. Only the Son suffers in the flesh on the cross. And so equally, when we come to the great mystery of the Divine Eucharist, we can say, yes, the Spirit is present in Holy Communion, but it is a different kind of presence. The Spirit did not become incarnate. Therefore, the Spirit has no body and blood. We receive the body and blood of Christ, but not the body and blood of the Holy Spirit. So, on the basis of this differentiation, we're enabled to distinguish in the Godhead three sets of distinctive characteristics. Now, let's say at this point that the differentiation in the Holy Trinity as we said before, is on the level of hypostasis and hypostatic characteristics. The energy which comes from each one of the three persons comes from all three persons together. It's always helpful to think of the energy as the life of God, the Holy Trinity one essence, one life. And this is the 
life of the one shared essence, which is common to all. But let's take a look at the three levels of distinction to which I just referred a moment ago. As the Cappadocians called them, the tropoi iparxeos, the modes of existence. And here we have a very important distinction. You have the kina, those things which are held in common, and the akinomita, those things which are incommunicable. Incommunicable, they're not shared. So, firstly then, the distinctive characteristic of the Father, the Tropos Iparxeos of the Father, is that he is unbegotten, agenitos. For the second hypostasis, the hypostatic characteristic corresponds to the first, but in reverse, it's begottenness. The Son is begotten. And with the third, the distinctive characteristic is proceeding, where if you try to build an analogy on fatherhood and sonship, proceeding doesn't really help. We'll come back to that. But we may notice several things about this pattern, that the distinctions between the persons are grounded on their origin and we do not describe the essence of each hypostasis, but we have a name for the hypostatic characteristic, the tropos iparxeos, the mode of existence. St. Gregory the theologian develops this point in oration 29.16, his first theological oration on the Son, he says, the name Father is not the name of an usia, it's not the name of an essence. It's not the name equally of an energy, an energia, but it is the name for a schesis, a relationship. And I had said earlier that there's a question about the language of relationship, but St. Gregory the theologian does use this term, and he says, Father, Son, this suggests schesis, this suggests a relationship. If we say Father, we mean Father of a Son. Now, some, including Metropolitan Callistos, infer from this that the modes of existence that we distinguish in the Trinity, according to the Cappadocians, describe their interrelationship, their schesis. But, I think there is a but, I think that what Metropolitan Callistos is trying to do here is pave the way for a bridge between the Cappadocians and St. Augustine, where, as we shall see, God willing, the whole doctrine of the Holy Trinity, according to St. Augustine, is based on schesis, relationship. We'll go into that when the time comes, but here we see a point of convergence with Augustine. So a second comment that we might make about this is that the first and second hypostasis, when we speak of fatherhood and sonship, unbegottenness and begottenness. Yes, a clear analogy is implied, but we're speaking of an uncreated father and an uncreated son. So even if we say that a schesis, a relationship is implied, our reference point is to what we know and understand about father-son relationships in the created order. But the problem is deeper than that or in addition to that, because when we come to the question of the proprium, the hypostatic distinction of the Holy Spirit, then the schesis language breaks down. The schesis analogy, the analogy of relationships, breaks down. 
And I think that, as we shall see, in St. Augustine, it's only because he has an essentialist approach to the mystery of the Holy Trinity, where he really doesn't have a concept of hypostasis at all, that he is able to build his understanding of the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the same mystery, but he explains it in terms of relationship. Because when it comes to procession, this term is much more elusive. It doesn't help very much to say that the characteristic of the Holy Spirit is, first of all, agiasmos, sanctification, because surely that's characteristic of all three persons of the Trinity anyway. And the word ekporefsis, which obviously has a scriptural basis in John 15, 26, where we're told that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, doesn't convey any specific relation or analogy in the way that the word begottenness or birth does. So I'm going to leave that there for the time being. I'll come back to the question of how the Cappadocian fathers speak of the diversity, the threeness of God, because that is their great contribution. So we'll conclude with a brief discussion about what we've said so far. The term monarchy, monarchia, the archi, that denotes beginning. Archi, whether you use epia, which is cause, and that's correct, and whether you use the term archi, which means beginning or origin, that's what it suggests. There is an origin, there is a cause, and the mono part, of course, emphasizes that the Father alone and uniquely is the one from whom the Son springs forth and the, the Holy Spirit springs forth. This is true. All of this, as we said, is conveyed through language as best we can. Human language is limited. We, we have difficulty, of course, expressing anything outside of time, thinking outside of time, because our existence is in time. As we've said, the Aryans couldn't extricate themselves from identifying begottenness with beginning, birth with beginning, even if it was qualified as eternal or pre-eternal still didn't make any sense to them conceptually. So you have to appreciate the limitations of language. And as St. Gregory the theologian said, we're not going to quibble about the syllables that we use as long as the meaning is correct, as long as what we're trying to convey is correct. Because ultimately... The reality of God transcends anything we could possibly conceive of. So, yes, I think in modern writers, more has been said about kenosis and that self-emptying communion of love among the three divine hypostases. I wonder because I haven't checked this myself, I wonder how such writers as Dimitri Staniloy have said about that, because he went, in his presentation of the mystery of the Holy Trinity, I think he went further than most, but I don't know. Perhaps it's implied, doesn't sound wrong, but I think that the fathers like to be specific and concrete and say, this happened. This is what we see in Christ's saving work, kenosis. In human language, emptying means that you're giving and what you have is diminishing. 
but that's not the case. So God the Father possesses all the Godhead perfectly, fully, as does the Son, as does the Holy Spirit. The purpose of God's creation of man is to raise us up to the right hand of God the Father, which means to make us equal with him by grace, what the Son and Word of God is by nature, we have been called to become by grace, joint heirs with Christ. But this is to be continued. We'll continue next time, God willing. And when we have looked at the question of the diversity in God again, then we will compare what St. Augustine has to offer on this question and compare it with the Cappadocian Fathers because it's important to understand the differences. And then we can talk about that. That will be a, a good point to really pause and think about the shape of Orthodox theology and how it contrasts with the post-Augustinian approach. Please subscribe to our channel and share with your friends. Click on the join button below our video and become a friend or reader of the Mount Tabor Academy. Support our drive to introduce the theology and spiritual life of the Orthodox Church to the wider community.